Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the 2022 Georgia Drama Focus Symposium. And we're here doing a poster session. And here's our first poster presenter. Can you please tell us your name and where you go to college? Yeah. Greetings. I am Victoria Atkin, a rising junior from Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University. Excellent. And uh, who's the library in? And who's your mentor this summer? I was in the car lab and my mentor this summer was Paige Newton. Could you please tell us your name and where you go to 
time, they have to physically pat down on the if we have individual insect cells. Um, and as you can see from the results here, uh, the succulent cells which have the smallest genome and the least heterochromatic content, the most intensive over time. And here it has a lot of genome. But as you can see from the other two Yeah. 
process. Now, in order to create these tobacco visas, we have to first follow the fixed protocol. Essentially, essentially, the cells were transformed in, into cultures that were then transformed into agrobacterium infiltrations that were then injected into four-week-old tobacco plants. Right here, you can see a picture of of our one of our uh, positive controls, which which shows the timing of the virus to to move throughout the plant and affect the gene expression of the tobacco crop. Now, our experiment was set up um, with our treatment, which consisted of the tobacco rattle virus, which does the virus in this gene expression, and DNA fragments of OXT1, which is our gene of interest in order to come. Essentially, the negative control was the empty vector, the positive control was the PDS, and then we used a control that was non-specific to the gene in tobacco plants known as PRVGLP. Now, once the mutated crop is made, we can explore the water relations using a gas exchange machine and aquadust nanotechnology. Now, what is aquadust? Aquadust is a nanotechnology approach that can measure the local water potential in the xylem and mesophyll cells of leaves via FRET mechanisms. FRET mechanisms are the fluorescent resin, resonance energy transfer, which is which measures the distance between an acceptor and donor chromophore via fi, uh, fiber optic spectrometer. Now, once we get these uh, phenotyping measurements and get some variables from the which can include variables like the carbon assimilation, rate of transpiration, and the pressure depth, we can then move to the to calculate the overall However, most conclusive data came from our third batch of our Right here in figure eight, you can see this is a gel electrophoresis that shows um, uh, a PCR check uh, explaining explaining how we've designed the primers that we're using our PCR. Figure B right here is uh, in a note so showing the results from the PCR. We can see that the OST1 gene expression is down like a science compared to the wild type. I'm showing 30% of abundance of the gene of Now, when we go into our chemical measures, we have some statistical features here showing uh, comparing, comparing the science gene to the wild type. And figure A is comparing the carbon accumulation. Figure B is comparing the uh, local water potential and the outside style. Figure C is comparing the transpiration between the two. However, the only significant graph from the two people is figure C. And that's because this data aligns with our, our hypothesis. And, and we were thinking, you know, when we silence OST1 genes, the stomates are going to are, gonna remain open in a plant. And, and then, when the stomates are open, the transpiration rate should be great. So, in conclusion, we we concluded that this protocol can successfully uh, uh, suppress the expression of OST1 in the Cochiana benzene, and Aquila serves as a suitable nano source to measure plant water relations and the local water potential plant. Additionally, uh, future work is needed with additional replicates in order to organize the variability in gene expression and phenotype response. One can also use console microscopy to confirm that the are open in OST1 mutated and benthamiana plants. And phenotyping can be done in, in different conditions like heat stress, soil stress, uh, highlight intensity, or dark adaptive light. And overall, for my acknowledgement, I would like to thank uh, my mentor, Hong Wen Feng, and Sabia Feng, as well as the Age Group Researchers and the Gender Lab at BCI, Megan Truesdale, the BCI and Outreach Coordinator, and, and the NSF Crops Project, who funded my research. And that wraps it up. So thank you for that. That's very cool. Thank you. Congratulations. I appreciate it. Now we are going to head upstairs and see the next batch.
Could you email and tell us your name and where you go to college? Sure. My name is Caroline Artie Bowes, and I go to the college of Virginia. And whose lab were you in the summer? I was in George Sanders' lab and Leigh Bowes' lab. Can you tell us a bit about your research? Sure. So I studied the soy protein or the carnitine and sensitive protein in the water. And what did you find? So I was able to find that the pollen from plants with double um, mutations in soy 2 had higher amounts of non-viable pollen and also lower pollen germination rates compared to their single siblings. And we were also able to express soy 1 in the nucleus and maize protoplast, which we hypothesized had a lower affinity for their um, protein partner, Jazz, because um, my mentors produced data showed that while point two has strong interactions, point one has very weak interactions with the nucleus. So we hypothesized that if soy one has a lower affinity for jazz, we could express this in the base protocol, which would have the natural jazz present in the host background, and therefore be able to restore nuclear localization of soy which we were able to see. However, we were for the tool to interpret because our cells ruptured and our nuclei were free floating. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> um, so moving forward, both of these will have to be repeated to confirm the results and make sure that it's specific in the literature. So what is soy one and how does it work and all this? Do we know? Or? Sure. Yeah, so within the jasmonic acid signaling pathway, which regulates the development and biological activity of plants, the soy protein receptor binds to the hormone signal J A I C O and upon binding, this complex is able to bind to the jasmine sim domain. Um, and degrade this repressor. And once this repressor protein is degraded, transcription factors are then able to activate JA response genes, thereby regulating the development and Thank <laughs> you. 
Yeah, you go over there. Test, 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 test. 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 That sounds a little bit better. You try, you try. Okay. Test, 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 test. Are we back on or not? Oh, we're okay. We're back. <laughs> Follow me. Okay, we're to this poster. I think we need Eliza O'Donnell. Is that you? Yes. All right. All right. No problem. Uh, could you tell us your name and where you go to college? Yeah. Hi, 
Hi, I'm Eliza O'Donnell. I go to St. Lawrence University. And whose lab were you in this summer and who's your mentor? Great. So I was working in the Frank Lab with Ariel and I was also working on a social engagement project with under Bruce Lewinstein and Becca Harrison. All right, great. Can you tell us a bit about your research? Yeah, of course. So my project was really unique. I actually had two different projects. I was working on a social engagement project and then also as a plant biologist. So our social engagement project, it started by acknowledging that just as we exist in a patriarchy, we exist in a culture of white supremacy. And this culture serves to construct and maintain a power elite and to divide us from each other. And Tima Okun um, has written these characteristics of white supremacy culture. So we use those to critically examine the culture of science in the United States. So we had small group discussions and a workshop with other RU interns. And then from those discussions emerged four characteristics of white supremacy culture that are particularly prevalent. And those are fear, hierarchy, perfectionism, and objectivity. And these characteristics prevent scientists from engaging proactively and mindfully with social and ethical issues, which has been a real problem because that engagement doesn't come during the scientific process. Is that if anything, it comes at the end. And we've seen that with like GMOs. Um, so that was one project. And then on the other side, I had a plant science project. And we were looking at communication in, in between cells and tomato plants. And a really important part of that is small signaling molecules traveling via the plasmodesmata. So if we can selectively block plasmodesmata, that would be a really important tool in studying how these signaling molecules move and where they move in the plants. So we've developed a line to start to be able to do that. And this line of tomato plants, when exposed to estradiol, it builds up callos, which is like this carbohydrate, and it blocks the plasmodesmata. So my job this summer was to functionally characterize this line of tomato plants. So I was able to visualize the cells and then to quantify the callos deposit positions that we saw. And we found that there was no difference between leaves that were exposed to estradiol and those that were not exposed to estradiol. Um, so the Frank Club's going to continue to work on that. And we can actually bring these projects together with the use of a metaphor. So that's what you see happening in the middle of my poster. So we can see the iCal 3M tomato plant as a metaphor for a white supremacy culture. Because just like a scientist had to chemically integrate the iCal 3M construct into the wild type tomato plant, white supremacy culture doesn't necessarily exist in a culture. It's something that's been constructed over generations and generations. And just like the construct then call it, causes these talent those depositions to come into the plasma desmata and block molecular communication signals, the characteristics of white supremacy cu culture show up in institutions across the United States and then prevent scientists from mindfully and proactively engaging with these really important social and ethical issues that could, if there was better engagement, help them do better science. Yeah, so that's my two projects. That, that's excellent. And I like the way you tied them both together there at the end. Thank you very much. Yeah, congratulations. Yeah, have a good rest of your yeah. summer. Yeah. Okay, we're moving on. Could you please tell us your name and where you go to college? My name is Anna Lapari. I go to Grinnell College. And whose lab were you in this summer and who's your mentor? I was working in Fei Wei Li's lab with Dr. Lee himself. Yeah, excellent. And uh, could you tell us about your research? Sure. Uh, so this summer I was working on developing Rubisco manilis as a model for the study and kinetic optimization of Rubisco. Uh, so we begin with this problem in the plant kingdom. Uh, Rubisco is the only enzyme capable of fixing atmospheric CO2 into a form usable by organic life. None of us could exist without it, but it's not actually that great at what it does. Um, it's slow and inefficient, and it's the limiting factor for 
for how fast plants can grow, so how fast we can grow food. A potential solution to this problem comes in the form of Proficium manilis, which is this unassuming red algae that turns out to have a rubisco, which vastly outperforms the kinetics of any rubisco found in a green plant. If we could insert this red rubisco into another plant, we could speed up its growth, potentially produce more crops and save lives. Uh, this hasn't ever worked yet before. Rubisco from Proficia fails to assemble in other plants, likely because its helper proteins, its chaperones and assembly factors aren't there to help it assemble. In order to uh, locate these assembly factors, we would like to look at the genome and proteome of Proficia, specifically those of the chloroplast, which is where Rubisco is encoded and folded. Uh, there's no published genome for Proficia yet, and no reliable way to isolate the chloroplast for proteomic work, so that's where my research comes in. Um, this summer, I extracted DNA from Griffithia and sequenced it using Oxford nanopore. Uh, we assembled genomes for the chloroplast and mitochondria of Griffithia, annotated and analyzed them. During the assembly, we noticed bacterial contamination in several of our liquid algae cultures. So at that point, I started testing antibiotics to figure out what would successfully decontaminate Griffithia. I also purified chloroplast using two different protocols designed for different species to see if they would work so well in Griffithia. Uh, here you can see our genome assemblies um, for the chloroplast and the mitochondria. There are a few interesting unknown open reading frames found in the chloroplast that don't map well to any known red algae genes. They do match up with a proposed plasmid insert or horizontal gene transfer events noted in other red algae. I found two antibiotics capable of uh, slowing bacterial growth in liquid Griffithia cultures without harming the algae itself, kenamycin and ampicillin. So the next step there would be to combine these two antibiotics and figure out an effective dose to fully decontaminate the algae without killing it. Um, our chloroplast isolation revealed that there are better ways and worse ways of crushing the cells to release the chloroplasts. Liquid nitrogen crushing works best. Um, and we do think that we're finding some isolated chloroplasts, especially using our second protocol. However, the total purity and intactness of this chloroplast aren't known yet, so further research is needed there as well. Um, at the end of my summer, I have not yet cured world hunger. However, I do think there's some really interesting research here to be done on Griffithia and its remarkable rubisco to advance our understanding of plant biology. Yes, that's excellent. I, I have one question. Um, if I recall, in, in green plants, uh, rubisco has one peptide uh, encoded in the chloroplast and one in the nucleus, right? Is, it, is that the same for this red algae or is it all in the chloroplast? So for red algae, the large and small subunits of rubisco, as well as its activist protein, are all encoded in the chloroplast. We've sequenced them here. Um, so we think that there's a high likelihood that any other assembly factors and chaperones would also be found in the chloroplast, since that's where it's folded and assembled. That's fascinating. Great job. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll move on. Hello. Hi. Could you please tell us your name and where you go to college? Uh, my name is Isabella Marshall, and I go to school at Rowan University in New Jersey. And uh, whose lab did you work in, and who was your mentor? I worked in Dr. Lau's lab with Mira, and also the Cape Niffin lab with. Um, sorry, one second. Um, with Lee. Sorry, I only worked at the biology lab a little bit. That's okay. Uh, could you tell us about your research? Yeah, so basically I'm an engineering student and I work between an engineering and a biology lab this summer to kind of help modernize some uh, more difficult and older biology, biology techniques. So uh, the bio, bio lab was having an issue looking at uh, soil microbial activity because it can be very expensive and uh, resource intensive to look at. And so we're trying to find a quick, portable and affordable version of doing that. So what we did is we created this four electrode system that allowed us to look at um, samples and get electrochemical data from them. And basically the goal is that this four electrode, four, four electrode system can work with an ultrasonic imager chip that is being developed in the Lao lab as well um, to kind of create a chip that gathers electrochemical, ultrasonic, and optical data about um, soil samples all at once. And so basically what we did with these is we prepared samples at different dilutions of different types of bacteria and we connected our chip to something called a source meter, which allowed us to apply voltage across these different samples and look at the current coming out of them. Um, and from that, we were able to look at how much bacteria is in each of the samples. So here you can see that our um, least diluted, most pure samples had the highest amount of current coming out of them. And as they continued to become diluted, 
um, we saw less current coming out of them as expected. While this told us that like the order was correct, right? The most diluted had the most current and the least diluted had the least current. Um, we wanted to make sure it was actually uh, a representation of how much bacteria was in the sample. So when we prepared, when we prepared these samples, we plated them in agar to uh, look at the CFU count, which tells us the bacterial concentrations basically. Um, and what we did is we took the slope of each of these samples, um, which tells us the conductivity value basically. And we plotted them against our CFU count, which is scaled to each dilution. And we found a nearly perfectly linear correlation between them. So not only is this in the right order, but it's actually representative of how much bacteria is in each sample. That's fascinating. So uh, what does that tell us uh, that we can do in the future? So we have a few ideas of what's going to happen in the future. Currently, we just uh, did this testing with um, bacteria samples, but we want to start testing with soil soon. Um, we also want to test with different types of materials. So we did this testing on a silver board, which can sometimes have uh, issues with live bacteria. Um, but we started testing with a carbon board, which started to give us much more precise and more linear results. Um, like I mentioned before, we hope to kind of work on this in combination with the ultrasonic chip. And we're going to continue to try to make this a very fast and portable piece of equipment so it could be used for um it can be used for uh, research projects that are not necessarily in a lab or um, that need something that's portable okay well, that's fascinating congratulations that was thank an excellent you. job thank you Hello. Could you please tell us your name and where you go to college? Yeah, my name is Jenna Sins, and I go to college at Gannon University in Erie, Pennsylvania. And whose lab were you in this summer, and who is your mentor? I'm in the Lee Lab, and my mentor is Declan Lafferty. Can you tell us a bit about your research? Yeah, so in the Lee Lab, we do a lot of research on bryophytes, um, and right now we're doing research on hornworts. I learned that hornworts are really interesting, but they're not popular research organisms, so there's not a lot of uh, research methodologies developed for them. So my objective this summer was to create a gene transformation methodology, um, and I focused on biolistic gene transfer. Um, so the basics of biolistic gene transfer um, is that you coat DNA particles on gold, and then you use something called a gene gun and you shoot the gold particles into the hornwort tissue and then we can evaluate how well that worked with gfp fluorescence and antibiotic resistance um, and basically the results of my experiment this summer were that we initially were getting 10 events um, per plate um, so we weren't doing that well with our um, biolistic gene transfer but after um, analyzing literature and changing up the methodology a little bit we're now getting between 600 to 800 um, transformation events per plate. Um, so now we can use biolistic gene transfer to do research in hornworts. That's fantastic. Well done. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. Thank you. Hello. Could you please tell us your name and where you go to college? Uh, my name is Holly Myers and I go to Washington College in Maryland. Great. And who, uh, whose lab were you in this summer and who was your mentor? I was in the Paveda lab and Haley Schroeder was my mentor. Oh, great. Can you tell us about your research? Yeah, awesome. So this summer I looked at exploring how landscape simplification and agricultural expansion influences wild plant defenses as mediated by shifts in herbivorous insect populations. So as we know, agriculture cultural expansion is a very actively rapidly expanding process as our um, populations rise we also really see an expansion of agriculture and I think when we think about this through an entomology like a lens we often think about the effect that um, large-scale agriculture is having on like pollinator populations so often in the literature there's a lot of research that's done about how agriculture um, is linked to a decrease in pollinators. Um, but our lab actually has done previous research where we found a similar trend in herbivorous insects as well. So we saw that in simple, more agricultural landscapes, that there was lesser herbivores and herbivory in general, and that then in our more complex landscapes, we saw increased herbivory. And this is important because flea beetles or herbivorous insects um, can be really important agents of selections uh, in wild plant evolution 
Japan, particularly in defensive traits. So this kind of left us with the question of considering how this differential gradient of herbivorous insects is affecting defensive traits in wild plants. So we expected that in complex landscapes where we saw increased herbivory, that we would see um, a type of defense called constitutive defenses, which is when our plants are defended 100% of the time. And then in simple landscapes where we saw lesser herbivory, we expected that we would see a type of defense called induced defenses, which is when the plant is only chemically defended once um, damage has been inflicted on the plant. So to jump to our results for the sake of time, we found our most really interesting and striking results in our comparison between complex and simple landscapes in non-induced plants, so pre-herbivory. So um, for our experiment, we did both a flea beetle, which is an herbivorous insect um, choice bioassay and a matching like a chemical analysis that we could compare together. So in our flea beetle choice bioassay here, we looked at um, the differential leaf damage inflicted by our herbivores on um, leaves from differing landscapes. And we saw that in simple landscapes, um, a significantly larger um, degree of damage was inflicted on our plants as we would expect based on our hypothesis and that in our complex landscape, we saw less herbivory. But interestingly, when we then looked at our chemical analysis um, uh, from these plants, our results didn't exactly match up. So we looked at glucosinolates and saponins, which are um, a type of defensive compound found in our um, study plant. And we actually saw that there was no significant difference between our glucosinolates and saponins between our complex and simple landscape, which is not what we expected, because we would have expected to see um, increased glucosinolates and saponins in our complex landscape where we saw lesser herbivory. But it leaves us with an um, interesting question to think about moving forward of what else could have been influencing this um, herbivore choice? Um, so two things that we were considering were that it could potentially have been some type of physical defense that we didn't think about or other chemical defenses that just weren't tested here. Yeah. That's fascinating. Well done. Thank you so much. Congratulations. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Uh, could you please tell us your name and where you go to college? My name is Reagan Griffin, and I go to Centenary College of Louisiana. And whose lab were you in this summer, and who is your mentor? I was in the Nelson lab, and my mentor was Kyle Paulos. Right. Can you tell us about your research? I sure can. So this summer, I worked with long non-coding RNA, or link RNA. And link RNA are genes that are found in all living organisms that do not code for proteins, but do play a critical role. Um, link RNA have only recently begun to be discovered in about the last two decades or so. So there's a lot of unanswered questions about them and a lot of unknowns revolving around link RNA. But we do know some of the functional uh, mechanistic roles that they play, shown here in figure one. We have guide, scaffold, and decoy. These are three roles that link RNA um, do play. <laughs> so link RNA um, scaffolding and guiding kind of go hand in hand. Proteins bind to the link RNA um, during scaffolding, and then they're transported throughout the cell and delivered at their intended location. And then um, link RNA can serve as a decoy um for regulatory rna regulatory rna bind to the link rna and that inhibits them from getting to their um, intended target within the cell so even though we know um, some of the mechanistic features of link rna we don't know necessarily what they do especially in plants there's very little research done in that area so the nelson lab explored um, link rna in the family brassicaceae which is the family responsible for cabbages broccoli mustard seeds um, and other plants along those lines um, they explored seen in figure two four representative species of the family brassicaceae and they did rna sequencing on them to determine um, a set of these link rna RNA that potentially played a functional role in the genes. Um, the, this subset was explored further and an expression profile was created for them shown in figure three. And as you can see, there are two major peaks shown in figure three, one at roots and one at seeds and seedlings. This led the Nelson lab to believe that there was a functional role of link RNA in seeds and seedlings, as well as the roots, which led to our experiments this summer. 
So we um, decided to investigate this using phenotypical characteristics of plants. So we planted three mutant link RNA, which did not contain the link RNA, and then the wild type, which did contain the link RNA. So the mutants are represented in blue, green, and yellow, and the wild type is shown in this maroon color. And our results were that the mutant link RNA um, had much shorter root lengths than the wild type did. And um, this was important because this led us to believe that link RNA do in fact play a functional role in um, early seedling development. We also did a germination rates experiment, which found that there was some variation in mutants um, and versus wild type. And we found that in um, this link RNA, we had very low germination rates, whereas some of these seemed um, very little effect or unaffected entirely by the mutant characteristic. Um, this led us to also believe that there's a likely a role link RNA play in seed germination. Um, and so in addition to these experiments, we also found that link RNA were highly conserved across species in the failing grass casey. This is extremely unusual. Link RNA are not conserved across species of any families. Um, so this led us to believe that there's likely a critical role that um, this link RNA candidate does play in, um, in <laughs> this uh, species. Um, so in order to like validate these experiments, we would need to do replicate trials and further molecular work. But um, I think that this is really important results. So thank you all for your yeah, time. That's fascinating. Congratulations. Thank you. thank you for sharing with us today. Great. Hello. Hi. Could you tell us your name and where you go to college? Yes. My name is Mally Simmons, and I go to Centenary College of Louisiana. And whose lab were you in this summer, and who's your mentor? I had the honor of working in the Nelson lab this summer, and my mentor is Alyssa Curley. Great. And can you tell us about your research? Yeah, of course. So this summer, I worked with small open rooting frames or source containing link RNAs. So when it comes to understanding the functional elements of the genome, relatively a lot less is known about long non-coding RNA transcripts than we know about coding RNA transcripts. So right now, there's been a little gray area of covered up what distinctly classifies transcripts as coding or non-coding. So the Nelson lab did did a recent re-annotation of a subset of link RNAs and found that some of them contain small open rooting frames of less than 100 amino acids in length. This finding was really exciting because it showed us that there, these link RNAs do have the potential to possibly undergo translation and even be considered as coding. So for my project this summer, I focus on the Arabidopsis plant where I use tDNA, tDNA insertions in these link RNAs to see if there would be any phenotype typical effects caused by the insertions. So what we did is the specific SORF containing link RNAs that we chose to work with was due to their high level of conservation within the family of Brassicaceae. Usually high levels of Brassicaceae, I mean high levels of conservation are typically seen in protein coding RNA transcripts. So that was really exciting for their, again, ability to hopefully undergo translation. So then we took that a step further and look at the expression data in the tissues of our Arabidopsis plants. And we wanted to see specifically where expression levels are highest so we can look where are we most likely to see a phenotypic effect from these tDNA insertions. So that led us to specifically looking at root length and rosette size using two different phenotyping methods. Our first phenotyping method we used low throughput phenotyping where we plated our seeds on clear media so we could clearly observe root growth. We were able to eventually over time trace these roots which gave us the data we see over here where we're comp comparing our wild type root lengths to the root lengths of our plants with the insertions. And we do see actually quite a bit of variation. So for this specific um, insertion line, we actually see the root lengths growing faster than it did for the wild type plants. But for these particular two insertion lines, we actually see slower root growth in our tDNA insertion lines versus our wild type plants. So for our second phenotyping method, we use high throughput phenotyping to specifically focus on rosette size. So for this method, we planted our, we planted our seeds in soil and used a Raspberry Pi computer to take frequent images of these plants. We were then able to use an image analysis pipeline to quantify our data about rosette size and we get what we see over here, where we're again comparing our wild type plants to our plants with the insertion. And we still see quite a bit of variation in our data, but a lot less. So for these three insertion lines, we actually see rosette size be larger in our wild type plants. But for this insertion line, we actually see a larger rosette size in our 
plants with the insertions. So while there is quite a bit of variation to our data, we actually do see phenotypic effects caused by these tDNA insertions. So of course, this is preliminary. We can consider this preliminary data, and more variations to our experiments, and more replications to our experiments would need us to. We would need to perform to draw future conclusions about our source-containing link RNAs, which is really exciting for future research. That's really cool. Thank you. Yeah, very good job. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Could you tell us your name and where you go to college? Absolutely. I'm Adam Kaysen, and I attend Samford University in Birmingham, Alabama. And whose lab were you in this summer, and uh, who's your mentor? I was in Dr. Fay's bioinformatics lab under the mentorship of Dr. Jing Yin Yu. And could you tell us about your research? Absolutely. Uh, so this summer, I was involved in creating spinach-based version two, which is a online publicly accessible spinach genetics and genomics database. Uh, so the original spinach base was created by another REU student in 2018, but they only had access to the SP75 spinach genome, which is a variety of spinach. Uh, but since then, four more genomes of spinach have been sequenced, and the web extension that we used to build the website database upon was um, upgraded from its version two to version three. Uh, so this summer, we took advantage of these two characteristics and made a whole new database using the latest version of triple, all five spinach genomes, and the most current public database information and uh, analysis programs that are available. So in order to populate and build this database, we annotated each genome's gene sequences using a variety of different programs that each do different things that we can help uh, to configure the tools on the database site. And then we uploaded it to the database, which is held on a server at BTI um, and implemented various uh, tools. So two that I'll highlight here, this is a similarity search. So it's basically an in-house blast feature. So you'll input a nucleotide or protein sequence here, and it'll give you the most similar gene sequences from the spinach genome that you specify here. And the keyword search similarly uh, determines genes you might be interested in, but this one you can either search by name of the gene specifically, or by a keyword in the description of the gene to try to um, get a list of any genes that a researcher or a breeder might be interested in studying. That's fascinating. And I, I heard you just mentioned researchers and breeders. Are they the ones who will use this primarily? Definitely. So uh, with the whole site, we want to give researchers and breeders uh, a single stop uh, to access all of the available information in one place. Great. That's fantastic work. Congratulations. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Oh. Hello. Is this your poster? All right. Oh, thank you. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> uh, could you tell us your name and where you go to college? My name is Amy Sollenberger. I am a third year mechanical engineering student at Brown University. And whose lab were you in this summer and who is your mentor? I was in uh, the Gore Lab and the Shepherd Lab. Uh, my mentor in the Gore Lab was Aaron Farmer, and my mentor in the Shepherd Lab was Anand Mishra Kumar. And um, Can you tell us about your research? I this summer I worked on two projects that both focus on the rhizosphere and below ground phenotyping. Um, in the Gore Lab, I started off with uh, helping out with the root exudate collection. Um, so we're collecting root exudates across 10 maize genotypes to look at how the uh, uh, nitrification inhibiting compounds vary across different maize genotypes to try and uh, find a genotype that could potentially reduce the nitrous oxide emissions of maize agriculture. Um, so in order to do this, uh, we have this whole procedure where we have to physically remove the plant from the soil, clean the root, put it in a syringe, and flush it with deionized water, and then come back the next day, flush it again, and then on the third day, we can finally actually collect our sample. Um, so, and, and from what I've heard, that's pretty much the way that it goes for root exudate collection and any sort of like soil collection in general is that it's very disruptive to the plant and it's time consuming and um, and though there have been like 
robotic sensing and has really made its way into agriculture research as far as like drones and rovers in the field, there hasn't really been a similar advancement for below ground phenotyping, which is what I was working on in Shepherd Lab. Um, so this is a robotic earthworm that we've been designing to uh, actually take data underground and swim in, through the soil. Um, it's a pneumatic soft robot and uh, made of 3D printed silicone. So my first task was to uh, develop a gait pattern inspired by the way that earthworms move. Um, and, and I did this by using Arduino to uh, control valves that limit the air pressure in each chamber um, and then next we move to the soil locomotion which is the biggest challenge because soil has a lot of variations as I'm sure you know and 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 just the content of the soil determines a lot about how it behaves and the kind of things that you need to do in order to travel in it uh, we found that like the auger which is this part here um, the, the optimal auger dimensions and like parameters depend greatly on the type of soil that it's swimming in and the moisture and cohesion. Um, so we tested a bunch of different augers um, and had some success at getting it moving underground. I would have a video, but my computer's dead. <laughs> but yeah, and then I moved on to integrating sensors. Um, we're going to have a CO2 sensor for plant respiration, uh, a temperature and humidity sensor for the soil temperature and humidity. Um, as well as a camera to get some small images of the, the surrounding roots and soil. And then we also have a current sensor on the motor, which we're hoping will give us some measurement, like a real-time measurement of the soil properties. Because since the, the motor will draw more current when it encounters more resistance, that can sort of give us maybe some type of measurement that can be correlated to real soil properties. And we can actually have you know, a sensor for the soil properties as it's traveling as well. Uh, That's really cool. I was not expecting to see a, a robot worm today. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, congratulations. This is fantastic work. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing with us. We will move on. Hello. <laughs> okay. Hello. Hello. Uh, can you tell us your name and where you go to college? Sure. My name is Omar Shah. I go to the College of New Jersey. And whose lab were you in this summer? I was in Dr. Jander's lab this summer. And who's your mentor? Oh, my mentor was Guillermo. Guillermo. Yeah, excellent. Could you tell us about your research? Sure. So um, I worked on the jasmate signaling pathway, which controls a bunch of important processes in plants, including growth, development, and defense. The main compound in this pathway is jasmonic acid, and upon herbivory or mechanical wounding, jasmonic acid is induced and accumulates in a plant and it forms its bioactive form, jasmonic acid isoleucine via an aminosynthase. So I want to investigate this kind of reaction in corn. So I chose two candidate genes, one gene that has the alleged function of an aminosynthase and one gene that has the alleged function of amino hydrolase. I began my experiment by ordering um, four insertion lines, two insertion lines in this gene and two insertion lines in this gene. We then performed two experiments, a hormone quantification experiment in which we measured the product of this reaction in the different samples and also a caterpillar performance experiment. We placed caterpillar players on the plant and we and we kind of measured how well the plants could defend um, against the caterpillar. So just to kind of talk about my uh, results of my homework quantification experiment, um, before I start, just to kind of talk about these time points. Um, so the way we determined these time points was that after we wounded the plant and applied the oral secretion, 30 minutes later, we got we, we, uh, accumulated, we uh, collected this compound and then we ran the same procedure for this, but then 120 minutes after we applied the oral secretion of the caterpillar, we collected the compound again. So just to kind of talk about the results, for, the, um, for this insertion line, we suspected if we knocked out this enzyme, we would see a deficiency in this compound in the insertion lines compared to the mutant lines. And at the 30 minute time point, we see that. However, we see the exact opposite at the 120 minute time point. Now due to this kind of these inconsistent results, it was hard to draw any conclusion. Now for the JIH1 gene, um, we suspected if we knock out this enzyme, we would see an accumulation of this compound um, in the insertion lines compared to the, uh, compared to the control lines. And we actually, exhibited at both times which we saw the 
exact opposite where we saw deficiency. Now, like I said, we you know it was said that this was a hydrolase enzyme. But based on our results, we think that possibly this is a synthase enzyme and conducting the actually the exact opposite forward reaction. So to kind of complement our analysis, we ran a caterpillar experiment, like I said, and you can see even when we knocked out the enzymes um, in the different lines, the uh, plants defended equally the same compared to the control. So that wasn't very um, conclusive. Um, in the future, we hope to order more insertion lines for this IA aminosynthase gene um, to kind of see if we get these inconsistent results or, or we get more consistent results. And then um, we also want to run a, another experiment for the JIH1 gene um, because we did get some significant results and with the deficiency of the defensive compound in the insertion lines compared to the mu -in, I mean, compared to the uh, wild type. We want to see that reflect in the caterpillar performance experiment. So like in the mu -in samples, um, there was less defensive compound. So we hope to see in the caterpillars that feed on these lines uh, to gain more weight after a certain amount of time compared to the wild type. So thank you all for listening. I hope you learned a little bit about the uh, jasmine signal pathway. That's fascinating. Good thank job this summer. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Hello, excuse me. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, may we? <laughs> uh, could, could you tell us your name and where you go to college? So my name is Hersha and I go to Colby College, which is located in Maine. And uh, whose lab were you in this summer and who was your mentor? So I was with the Gore Lab and then my mentor was Marjorie. Okay. And uh, can you tell us about your research? Sure. So in my research, we mostly focus on microbes in the rhizosphere, which is the area of a soil that is surrounding a plant's roots. And we were also looking at nitrous oxide, which is a greenhouse gas that that's 300 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. And that gas can be released when microbes in the rhizosphere undergo a process called deification. So what we're looking at is if a certain mace of population that we plant above ground can lower the abundance of those denitrifying microbes. So that we can then lower the rate of denitrification and then use that to lower our greenhouse gas emissions from nitrous oxide. And we're also looking for any time, location, or genetic patterns that also may be occurring. So we hypothesize that we're going to be seeing more of these denitrifying microbes in the rice sphere versus in the bulk soil where there's no plant at all. And we also think that these microbes will be increasing with time. So what we did is that we input in data collected by Walters and his team in a past study into a bioinformatics program called PyCurse 2. And from PyCurse 2, we were able to get all all the abundances that were occurring in each of those samples, along with the abundances of that particular pathway. So then we filtered it to these five pathways that were involved in denitrification. So once we had this output from Cypress, we added onto it with environmental time and genetic data using a statistical analysis program called STAMP. So here's all my STAMP data. And so from STAMP, we found that with time, the abundances of these denitrifying microbes did in fact increase. So you can see see that here that as you get later in the weeks you see more of these microbes and we also found that there were differences in the abundance of these microbes depending on the type of maize of population that you planted particularly in Lansing and Columbia so that's what we have here and then from stamp another importing data that we got that we were able to collect is that there were differences in the abundances of these microbes depending on if you're looking at bulk soil where there's no plant at all versus if you're looking at just the rice appear. So that's what we had from this graph right here. So basically, in conclusion, we were able to identify five nitrogen pathways that were occurring in our samples rhizospheres. And we also saw that there were differences in those abundances of those microbes, depending on the time you were at, and also depending if it was from the bulk soil versus from the rhizosphere. And now we're gonna continue this research using maize hybrids right now. And we're gonna see that if a certain maize hybrid correlates with low abundances of those denitrifying microbes, we can send that information on to breeders so that we can all work to lower our nitrous oxide emissions by decreasing the rate of denitrification because greenhouse gas is so, so common. So it's just really nice to be on a part of an impactful project like this one. Yeah, that's excellent. Congratulations. Thank you. Good work this summer. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Uh, could you tell us your name and where you go to college? Yeah, my name is JJ Wheeler. I go to Tufts University. And whose lab were you in this summer and who is your mentor? My mentor is Ruth Epstein and we are in the Pulaski lab um, at Cornell. Great. Can you tell us about your research? Yeah, for sure. So 
what I studied this summer is um, the recombination in maize. Um, recombination is the mixing and matching of alleles from different parents. Um, and so what I studied specifically is how recombination changes over the course of domestication. So I compared the recombination landscapes, which is, you know, the location of recombination events. Uh, and I compared it to maize's wild ancestor, Teosinte, and an early domesticated form of maize called maize land race. Uh, and what I found is that overall, these recombination landscapes were very similar. Um, as you can see, these plots have generally the same shape, um, which shows the same pattern. So in the center, there's these dead zones. That's where the centromere of the chromosome is. Um, and that's because as you move away from the centromere, there's less methylation and less chromatin, um, which generally means more recombination. Um, the DNA is more free to cross over and uh, exchange genetic information. Um, however, on a finer scale, there are differences across the three different populations. So for instance, right here in Landrace in green, you can see this large peak, and that's a hotspot that's unique to Landrace, whereas maize has its own hotspot right there, which is a little bit away from the hotspot. And then Teosinte also has its own hotspot. Um, and that's what this Venn diagram down here is representing, just the number of hotspots that are shared across the populations. They each have their own unique hotspots, but they also share some hotspots. Um, and so the idea is that some of these hotspots that are changing are relevant to domestication, that the changes in recombination are, are relevant to human and post selection. Um, so I studied things like which genes are in the sites where recombination changes the most. Um, I actually didn't find much relationship between domestication genes um, and where recombination is changing. So um, the overall finding with there is that there's a lot more going on to change those finer scale shifts in recombination rate and those shifts in hotspots um, than just human selection. Um, there's, there's a lot of changes like epigenetic changes as I mentioned methylation that, that might be at play. Um, but yeah, and overall we found also that maize and maize land races were more similar to each other than they were to Teosinte, the wild ancestor. Um, and we found that maize and maize land races have an overall higher recombination rate, um, which is consistent with previous findings with other plants that domesticated varieties of plants have overall higher recombination than the wild varieties of plants. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. Good work. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Yeah, of course. Thanks for stopping by. Yeah. Have a good rest of your summer. You as well. And I think we're going to our last poster. Oh. I will wait. We have dueling cameras. <laughs> Hello. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Hello. Uh, could you tell us your your name and where you go to college? Sure. You want to drink water first? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Could you tell us your, your name and where you go to college? Sure, my name's Jasmine. I go to, to college at Huntington University. I'll be a rising senior. Great. And uh, whose lab were you in and who was your mentor? I was in the Givinoni lab and my mentor was Anna Hermans. Great, they're great. And uh, could you tell us about your research? Sure. Sure. So um, my, uh, my research this summer was uh, variation analyses of carotenoid metabolites and gene expression across multiple tomato accessions. So for our research, we were looking at carotenoids. Carotenoids are the pigments that are involved in, um, uh, that are responsible for the reddish to yellow color in tomato. So what we were interested in was looking at uh, carotenoid accumulation and correlating that with uh, gene expression for, uh, for uh, each of the, the key carotenoids. <coughs> Excuse me. And so what we uh, what we did was we looked at several to, uh, different tomato species. So like a persicum modern, as you see here, like a persicum heirloom, to farm here, cherry tomatoes and wild species. Right. We collected fruit samples for uh, each of these accessions at three developmental stages. So mature, green, breaker, and ripe. Yeah. And we looked at three replicates of each of those. So we the first thing we did was freeze and grind the pericarp of the, the each of the 
uh, samples. Yep. And then we performed carotenoid extractions and RNA extractions. And then finally, we did three types of analysis, which you see here. We, we did carotenoid variation analyses, gene expression analyses, and correlation analyses. So we were really interested in looking at the significant differences between the different accessions, either at a different accessions at the same stage or different stages in the same accessions. So we wanted to look at six key carotenoids in the pathway. So um, we looked at phytoene, phytofluene, beta carotene, translycopene, beta carotene, and lutein. And so for our first analyses, for our carotenoid accumulation analyses, we saw some interesting findings. So we actually saw that beta carotene down here had the highest variation between accessions, and beta carotene tended to have the highest variation between stages. And then for lycopene, which is the most important carotenoid in the pathway, we saw the highest amount of variation between uh, stages, and which you can also see in the two of our charts here. So at mature green, there was no lycopene accumulation, and then at ripe, we saw the highest amount of lycopene accumulation. Makes sense, right? And then for gene expression analyses, um, we were looking at the whole transcriptome. So we saw what we saw here is that we had the highest significant difference for the stages mature green versus breaker than for breaker versus breaker seven or ripe. And then for this analysis, we looked at five different groups of genes, morphology, flavor, carotenoid biosynthesis, carbohydrate metabolism, and key ripening regulators. And what we saw was that for, between stages, we had the highest amount of variation for key ripening regulators and carotenoid biosynthesis genes here. And then finally, for our correlation analyses, we, um, we were looking to correlate our gene expression data with our carotenoid accumulation data. And we saw some really interesting findings. We looked at five of the key carotenoids in the pathway here. And so notable findings were that there was wide variation not only between species, but also between, um, between uh, accessions within the same species. So for example, we saw um, lycopersicum 121, lycopersicum heirloom, tended to actually have higher correlation values than for some of the modern species. So for example, lycopersicum uh, modern 74 had the highest accumulation of lycopene. So we expected that the modern species, would, since they had higher accumulation of lycopene, they would have higher correlation values. But what we actually saw was that heirlooms tended to have higher correlation values in spite of the fact that they had lower um, accumulation of some of the carotenoids. So that was really interesting finding. And then finally, we looked at key ripening regulators and we expected there to be a really strong correlation between key ripening regulators which act up this way in the pathway with all of the six carotenoids. And that's what we saw. Okay, that's fascinating. <laughs> that's, that's a lot of data you collected this summer. <laughs> Excellent work. Thank yeah, so yeah, congratulations. Thank, Thank you so you. much. And that is our last poster. So uh, we'll throw it back to the auditorium. And uh, this is so inspiring. There's so much great research here that these undergrad students are doing. Um, I think the uh, the next uh, session start at three. I'm honestly not sure what time it is now. It is about three. All right. It's 2.15. It's 2.15. All right, so we have 45 minutes. And uh, we'll see you back in the auditorium at three. Thank you very much. Thank you.